Hello and welcome. Good time zone, everybody. Welcome to Horde of Tales. My name is Marcus, pronouns are he, him, and I have the honor to welcome all of you to the first part of the Dance of Dreams, a Vason mystery. We are here to investigate strange hauntings, apparitions, and secrets in 19th century Sweden. I am the storyteller, game master of this game, and I have the honor to have the company of three investigators who I will give the floor to, to briefly introduce themselves and their character. And I'm just going to start to, on this overlay, the right of me, Kat. Hello there. I knew you were going to start with me. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kat. My pronouns are she, her. And today I will be playing Anna Rusk, uh, who is the uh, servant playbook. Um, and I will be the servant to one of the other characters who will introduce themselves shortly. Amazing. Great to have you on board. Let's move over to a certain other character and player. Ruben, welcome at the table. Well, in that order, my character, no, I am Ruben, <laughs> my pronouns are, uh, are he, they. Uh, I will be playing as Leto Bockfeld, playing as uh, the hunter, and I am assisted by a wonderful, wonderful servant. Fantastic. And the third investigator and third player at this table, first time on Horde of Tales also, Cash, hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Cash, uh, she, her are my pronouns. And yeah, thank you so much for having me for this first time. I'm going to be playing Rasmus, Rasmus Sigurdsson, who is a Navy officer of the Swedish Navy and um, who joined this group just uh, recently because he had a very interesting, very, very interesting meeting with a siren. And now he's very intrigued by Vason and wants to learn everything he know he can know about Vason from Rasmus. Uh, from from Leto. <laughs> <laughs> from himself. From, from himself. <laughs> a lot of the things we learn, we learn from ourselves. That's exactly. like a very profound thing to say. Amazing. It's like such Great. a smart man. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say he'll teach I'm himself. Like, why is why is character? <laughs> Glad to have all of you here. As mentioned, this is the first part of a two-part Vason game. Vason is a supernatural horror tabletop RPG created by Free League Publishing. And as the title of this game suggests, The Dance of Dreams, we are playing the Dance of Dreams scenario, which is included in the core book of the Vason rulebook. So if you enjoy what you see here on this stream, definitely make sure to check out Vason and the scenario included. I would also like to point out that this is indeed a supernatural horror game. It will get spooky here. And we advise viewers caution. If you at any point need to step away for a moment, feel free to do so and return whenever you are ready. Our players have all had during the session zeros, a Lions and Veils session where we discussed what, which themes are go and which themes are no go. And we're also making sure that everyone at this table stay safe as we get into this very creepy, creepy adventure. Talking about getting into a creepy adventure, how about I get us into that? Are you all ready? Sounds good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Can I still back out? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> just you and me later. <laughs> My student. <laughs> Let us imagine that we're going back in time to the 19th century and the location is Sweden. To be precise, a rural part of Sweden just to the south of the city of Uppsala, a still growing and bustling city, and especially in these times. Innovation and change sweep the land. The Industrial Revolution is coming to more corners of the earth and also Scandinavia is not safe from factories, machines, and other ways to ever improve productivity and ingenuity in the world. Things like a spinning jenny or a factory, however, 
seem rather far away for our investigators at this point. As the opening scene of this shows us the three of you in a small carriage pulled by two chestnut horses, their hoofs galloping over a muddy path drenched with water from the rain that's pouring down from the sky. You can hear the rain falling against the roof of the carriage, mingling with sometimes the comments of the carriage driver as he gets the horses to move faster to your destination. Thunder rumbles in the distance and the flash of lightning sometimes illuminates the inside of the carriage where we catch brief glimpses of our protagonists. All three of you on your way to your destination, following an invitation to the Witch Cat Inn. All three of you, not just any guests to this inn, you are members of the society. You have the gift of the sight, and you are capable to interact and see the so-called Vason, strange enigmatic creatures from folklore, magic, and maybe even more. The three of you are dry and warm in this carriage, even though the weather outside is wild. And as the camera moves inside to show us the three of you, let's get a better picture of who you actually are. And how about we start with Rasmus Sigurdsson? Yes. Rasmus. So Rasmus is about 22 years old, six foot four, so a very, very large guy, and also very muscular <laughs> and super handsome. Um, he's young, he has a very round face um, and kind brown eyes, and he's clean shaven. He has very bushy eyebrows that look a little bit like caterpillars, and he keeps his hair um, in a short brown, um, like a side parting. And at the moment, this hair is a little bit squished down by a, um, a buttoned, like a, like a buttoned cap that he wears, really pulled down and onto his, uh, onto his, uh, yeah, into his face. And he also wears a buttoned-up shirt with suspenders and a brown, very, uh, maybe a little bit too small jacket for him, <laughs> for his size. And he looks uh, through the carriage and looks as at his master or his his mentor, um, Leto, and looks uh, a little bit dreamy into his direction and kind of admires him at the mm. moment. Well, Mr. Sigurdsson, how do you enjoy the countryside? Oh, it's it's just so exciting. <sighs> Honestly, Leto, this is this is really exciting for me. The whole thing. Oh God, the last time I was on land, it's been many, many, many months ago, and now with you on this this grand adventure, I don't even know what to expect. Well, it's been a long time f since I've carried a, an apprentice with me. I mean, I consider I'm I'm Miss Rust. Excuse me, my equal in matters of the hunt, and you, I will be very pleased, of course, to teach what I know, provided, of course, the money. Sure, sure, uh, yes. the money, yes. Very good, <laughs> very good, Mr. Secretson. <laughs> yes, you. I've planned for the money, for paying you the money that I have, yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, I guess I'll introduce uh, Leto's looks. He, uh, yeah, he's... Um, Ragged looking, uh, 34, but looks about 10 years older. Um, sunken, uh, dark, wrinkled skin. Um, wears a um, flat hat, flat leather hat, um, hiding a little bit of disheveled graying hair. Uh, wears what seems to be like a church rope, and his hands are wrapped in bandages. Uh, and I guess next to next to uh, Leto um, is a an older woman. <laughs> um, she's a, about fifty five. Uh, she has graying. I don't think it's gone completely gray yet, but it is this sort of very light brown where it almost looks completely gray. Um, it is kept up in a very uh, neat bun. Um, 
and uh, she has a very angular face. Um, she's quite tall um, and uh, quite uh, bony. I think that people would describe her as a slightly um, severe looking woman, but with just this sort of trace of a smile almost constantly on her face. Uh, she wears a, a dress that is not very, very fancy, but it is not um, drab either. Um, uh, but it is it, in the kind of whether she's she's sort of a she kind of acknowledges as uh, as she's referenced by Leto, um, but she goes back to kind of uh, watching out of the window, um, and I think that she spent pretty much the whole journey uh, kind of watching out the window um, and occasionally remarking upon how I think probably about. 20 minutes before it started raining she remarked upon how it looks like it was going to rain even though there was some sun coming into the carriage and she was like no no mark my words it will rain um and sure enough 20 minutes later downpour <laughs> and it has been raining ever since anna has made this correct prediction about the sh uh, shift in the weather and so it has been raining for most of your, at this point, already two hour long carriage ride from the city of Uppsala. As members of the society, all of you have at least quarters in the headquarters of the society. Maybe some of you live there full time. Maybe some of you sometimes come there and maybe some of you just arrived there and are still getting settled at the entire idea of the society of people who interact with these supernatural creatures. No matter what is the case, all of you were brought here together and on this journey because an invitation, say maybe even a request for help arrived at your headquarters. One day you received what looked like a pamphlet for at first glance, a theater show, some kind of ballet. And this pamphlet titled the show as The Dance of Dreams. The pamphlet was written in a beautiful handwriting, very, very italic, curly, with um, beautiful strokes to every pen or pencil brush. And the subtitle of this invitation was a shadow play of horror, murder, and revenge. You should let yourself be enraptured and terrified by shadow theater with clockwork as amazing as that of the master's construction on the continent. Big words about such a thing as a shadow play, which for all of you would still be a fairly new and also niche form of entertainment. However, scrawled down on this at the on the bottom of this pamphlet is someone else's handwriting, a completely different handwriting and definitely not the writing of whoever wrote the rest of this pamphlet. In very quick letters, it says at the bottom of the pamphlet, meet me as soon as possible at the Witch Cat Inn, signed Olaus. That is spelled O-L-A-U-S, Olaus. So after you had received that invitation, all of you went about to prepare for this, well, whatever is happening at the Witch Cat Inn, be it a shadow play or something else. And I would like to hear from all of you in maybe a little bit of a flashback as we're sitting here, how each of you went about to prepare for the upcoming investigation. And this is actually a part of the play of every mystery in Vassen, where before you go out on the mystery, it is assumed that as skilled investigators, you make preparations and in some way make sure that you have additional information before you investigate um, and that you can use that at one point during this investigation to give yourself an advantage. Meaning in practical terms, you can use this advantage once in these coming two sessions to give yourself two additional dice on one roll where you need it. This kind of preparation and advantage gathering can be anything you want. And I'm just wondering, let's start with, let's start with the hunter himself, with Leto Bockfeld, knowing that 
your services would be required here. How would Leto Bockfeld have prepared for this? I think Leto would have asked uh, Miss Rask for social instructions because of the uh, because there will be more than three people around them. Uh, so I think a lot of it was trying to you know be instructed in the uh, subtle art of not losing your nerve in conversation, uh, being patient, and finish letting other people finish their sentences. The subtle, the subtleties of social observation. The subtle art of just being polite. <laughs> and if I understand it correctly, not just being polite, but also meaning when to restrain yourself, knowing yes. when not to just be abrupt and um, disruptive in conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Um, so that means if, if that is Leto's advantage for this, keep this in mind, you can also in your character sheet briefly summarize that under the advantage field. And if there's in these coming two sessions a moment where that preparation would have helped you, and maybe there will be conversation where Leto needs to know how to restrain himself, then you can use this advantage to give yourself two more dice in that situation. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. As the youngest and newest member of this team of investigators, how did Rasmus prepare? I think that Erasmus prepared in his room by frantically looking through his little um, duffel bag that he had with him where not a lot of stuff is in to look for something useful that he could take with him on this adventure. And he also looked through his briefcase or his uh, portemonnaie and looked inside for the money that he owes to Leto for training him and realized that he has no money at all. And instead, he just uh, quickly put this, uh, <laughs> this briefcase away and then looked uh, into his jacket pocket and found an old compass that he uh, kind of smiled onto and said, OK, maybe maybe this will give something or we be, maybe this will be something of you. So he just decided to take his compass with him. Is this an old compass that Rasmus also had with him um, in his earlier life? I think he would probably have had it with him on his, uh, well, I guess, first and last sailing tour that he did on the Baltic Sea. <laughs> and uh, it became a little bit water damaged after what happened to him, but he ended up getting it fixed. And that's probably also where he spent most of his money because it was quite an expensive compass. Oh. <laughs> so it is still a fully functioning compass. With, At the moment it is, yes. <laughs> with also some memories attached to it, though. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. So I would imagine with that kind of advantage, um, that could come up whenever maybe the party needs to find navigation. Mm -hmm. And I invite you to also see that in a more... Uh, in a less literal sense, mm -hmm. you're welcome to keep that in mind as well. Okay. And Miss Rusk, Anna <laughs> Rusk, how did your preparations go for this investigation? Well, uh, Miss Rusk likes to be prepared. Uh, I think that, um, especially as she knows that her young master, uh, Leto, sometimes likes to go barreling into situations. Uh, and, you know, I think she's very pleased that. Uh, uh, she's at least trying to learn how to uh, restrain, but she knows from experience that that might not necessarily work out uh, for him. Um, so I think that she would immediately have gone and probably uh, reached out to uh, make inquiries about the, the, the place and the area, um, maybe some of the, uh, like, the way around uh, what the town looks like, the kind of big things that go on there, maybe some recent uh, events that might have happened there that might be of interest. Um, just to try to get a little bit of a lay of the land. I think that this is where uh, Anna Rusk tends to let her skills lie. Perfect. With that, um, with that kind of preparation, there is quite some information that Anna would have also gathered. Mm -hmm. First of all, the witch cat mentioned does is not in any kind of town it is a wayside inn that is a few hours of a carriage ride to the south of Uppsala 
And from what you would have gathered is that for many years, it has been a very popular wayside stop for travelers heading south. Um, it's also close to the Lake Malar, a beautiful lake to the south of uh, Uppsala. And up until recently, the Witch Cat Inn had a really good reputation. However, things changed about 10 months ago, maybe 11. For some reason, people who have visited the Witch Cat have reported that the place looks more and more run down despite all the effort its owner is putting in the upkeep in fixing a leaking roof in weeding the garden in getting the horses in the stable to calm down during the night strange things seem to be happening there and th th those rumors about it have already made their way up to Uppsala from travelers who have stopped there um, there is, as mentioned, there isn't really a, uh, the, the inn isn't in a town, but the closest village, um, nearby is the village of Bilbu, that is B-I-L-L-B-Y, Bilbu. And, uh, Bilbu is, um, yes, a very small town with basically a church, two farms, and an apothecary working there. Mm -hmm. And next to that information, Anna, you will indeed also have an advantage in that. So if at any point in the coming investigation, um, any kind of prep that Anna has done would be relevant to a role, you can invoke this advantage and see if it helps you on the investigations. Mm -hmm. All right. Great to see the diverse ways in which these very different investigators prepare for the task at hand. And as we have seen like this kind of montage of flashbacks of everyone preparing in their own way, we are pulled back to the present by a very loud clap of thunder, quickly followed by a flash of lightning outside, and then the rain pouring down even harder and faster than before. You hear the squeaking of the carriage wheels as the carriage driver tries to get the horses to pull harder to try and drag those wheels out of the mud. You hear cursing from the driver and the wind actually slamming against the carriage, shaking it until it stops. The wheels move no more. You can hear the whinnying of the horses, the disgruntled sounds from having to work under these conditions. And then you hear the carriage driver jumping off into the mud, splashing sound as boots hit the ground. Two quick steps to the door of the carriage. The carriage door flings open. Your carriage driver, dressed in this long coat with a, with a hood on, completely soaked from the weather, looks towards all of you, dry and mostly <laughs> warm. He just looks up. We have arrived, he says in a low, grumbly voice, and just points behind him. A little gale from the Caucasus never hurt anyone. Thank you, good sir, for bringing <laughs> us here. Uh, I'm immediately in damage control mode as we're getting out of the carriage and uh, he's saying that and I say, we're so grateful for all of the journey that you have done for us. Uh, and um, uh, please, and I, I sort of produce a, a, an extra tip uh, a small sort of uh, a small sort of gold coin, and I'm like, make sure that you, the horses are well fed, and that you too, my friend. I think Rasmus yeah, will ahead. also step uh, uh, right behind Anna and also offer the guy a mint that he pulls from his jacket pocket and go. This is for for the voice I I hear. It's a little bit raspy, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm sorry. Did you catch a cold driving us here? What do you mean? Oh. I is, is that your normal voice? Your normal speaking voice? Yeah. Thank you again. <laughs> I kind of after, uh, after Rosbitz. I'm so sorry. As I believe that is the Bilbo accent. <laughs> the carriage driver, once all of you are out and he's taking the coin, he's taking the mint, even though he does not understand the purpose entirely. Um, <laughs> 
you he closes the door behind you uh if any if any of you have any kind of backpacks or uh luggage with you helps you get that out or off of the carriage as well but before you have any chance to further talk with him he's already back up on the coach and is turning the car carriage around back to Uppsala, leaving the three of you standing out in the pouring rain at a T intersection. To one side of you, in the distance, through this curtain of rain and dark clothes over you, you can see indeed Lake Malar, a lake that would be, on a beautiful day, fantastic to be near at. Some of the city folk go swimming there, and it's great in the summer to call down, but right now you can barely see its outlines. Further to the south of you, you can see indeed the outlines of the town of Bilby. There is, you can see the silhouette of the church tower and a few of the houses, but no one else on the road with this weather. Who would go outside in this weather? And then on the other side, you see the destination of your journey. An inn, a fairly large building flanked with the stables, a garden surrounding it. And at first it looks from this perspective, like any other roadside inn any of you might have seen before. But as thunder cracks and lightning illuminates it, you briefly see all the wear and tear on the building. Roof shingles hanging loose, vines and poison ivy growing over the outside into cracks in the plaster and the brick walls. Um, talking about bricks, there are indeed some parts of the brick walls that have collapsed and piles scattered in the mud around it. The stables look as if the roof of the stables could collapse any moment if a stiff breeze slaps against them. But you do hear from the inside of the inn, you hear chatter, you hear talk, you hear laughter. And outside, standing under the rooftop, you see a person, a large muscular man, similar build as Rasmus actually. And with a, I think you call them pork pie hats on um, a, a rough stubble over his jawline um, and um, a cigarette loosely in his hands by his side. He's wearing a suit that has water stains on them. And as he sees all of you, you see him look up, striking brown eyes. And he says, the Uppsala delegation, come, get out of the rain. Let me buy you a drink. I'm glad you received my invitation. Leto uh, leans over on my shoulder. Miss Rask, who might this be? Do I know who this is? <laughs> no. I guess that this might be uh, our, who, our, our Olaus, Olaus, is it? Olaus, indeed. Yes. That is correct. And I would assume, considering, Anna, what you have done as your preparation, as your advantage, um, you might have also stumbled upon some more information about this Olaus that sent you the note. Um, and this is indeed Olaus Klint. That's Klint with a K. And Olaus Klint is in Uppsala known as a private investigator. And he has been making a reputation for himself as a private investigator into occult phenomena. Mm. And going as you look, as you look at this person, this guy matches the description of that you heard of what Olaus Clint looks like. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is definitely the one who sent you the invitation. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I will. Uh, I will lean back in, uh, and I will say, "This is the mysterious bearer of our message." Olaus, Mister Clint, it is good to meet you. Miss Anna Rusk, am I correct? You are. And this you. is my master, Leto. Hello, Leto Bokfeldt. Yes, uh, and I'm, I'm also here. Uh, Rasmus <laughs> is my name, Rasmus uh, Sigurdsson. Good boy. 
Thank you. <laughs> well, I was just taking this presentation in for a moment, looking at each of you. Um, Leto, uh, you see that um, Olaus is very like quickly giving you like a top to bottom look as if he's trying to gauge you, um, trying to get a read on you real quickly. And he's keeping an eye on you, even at the point that Rasmus is introducing himself and just very briefly glances over at Rasmus and then back at Leto um, before he returns back to, uh, to Anna. If any one of you would like to kind of also get a read on Olaus, we could do our first roll of the session. And I see that Kat is already enthusiastically raising yes. the hand for, for Anna. I want to so, get a read on this guy. <laughs> yes. A brief explanation for how this works. So as we're playing Vason, Vason uses a dice pool system. And whenever the dice come up, you assemble a dice pool based on a number that you have in one of your attributes and one of your skills. And for this one, we're looking for, let's see, you're trying to gauge what this one's up to. Um, Anna, this would be an observation check. So this combines your empathy and your observation, and that should give you six dice in your pool, if I see that correctly. Yeah, it looks like that's the case. Now, usually for most checks, you will only need one success, and you have a success if at least one of your dice shows a six. Mm -hmm. Any more that you get is extra benefits. And for this check, you will only need one success on your dice. So how Wish about you roll like that? Everyone. And I hope I roll better than my test rolls earlier. <laughs> uh, okay. So, oh no. Oh yes, yes, I did. Yes. That is indeed one <laughs> success on the It had the symbol and I was like, is that a one or a six? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, Anna, what does it look like while you're trying to get a read on Olaus? Uh, I think it might be a little bit uh, disconcerting for Olaus, actually, because um, Anna is not a person who uh, breaks eye contact very easily. Um, a lot of people, I think, assume because she is a servant that uh, she, when she kind of introduces her master that she's going to sort of step back and uh, let uh, let him take over but um she's very much still by his side so she watches as he kind of looks uh later up and down and barely uh gives um barely gives rasmus a, a second glance so she's already sizing up who he thinks is the threat or who he thinks is the uh the the head of the group and and all of these things um i think that what will probably uh maybe make him a little bit disconcerted is that she's just doing exactly the same to him uh when when he looks back so this whole time she's looking at him like okay well i'm sizing you up at the same time that you're sizing everyone else up and i've got an advantage because i've only got one person to size up here so <laughs> okay. um, and um i think that there's this sort of like a a very keen intelligence uh, in Anna's eyes, especially when it comes to she's very protective of Leto. So she's kind of like at the same time as she's not breaking eye contact, she's probably like doing up his button a little more and pulling it hood <laughs> over his head and uh, just sort of uh, going through her bag and and sort of like uh, um, uh, just grabbing out the bandages in case that she's going to need to rewrap the bandages on yeah. her hands already. <laughs> She's very prepared, but she isn't, isn't, her eye contact doesn't leave for one moment. Mm -hmm. I Is think, I think Leto sort of like picks up on that. This is a, I think a rehearsed thing that they do to like, that's the only way that Leto knows, oh, this is Miss Ross using our signal to tell mm -hmm. me that mm -hmm. something's, you know, suspicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, uh, Rasmus doesn't pick up on any of that. <laughs> He's trying to uh, gather all the bags of everyone and then to carry all of them at once. I think that yeah. she does, um, because she gave up your mint, I think that as well, she's she's here to take care of both of you. So I think that she does also pop out of her bag a mint and give, and give one to uh, Rasmus to replace the one that uh, he gave away. Um, and uh, she's got like this kind of, there's a little bit of a dynamic duo uh, thing going on with Leto, but she's, she's also looking after Rasmus as well. Mm -hmm. Understood. 
Um, Anna, would you would you describe yourself as the kind of person who likes to have as much information as possible when necessary? Yes. <laughs> You get from all these observations that you do and with your clear advantage of only having to size up one person instead of an entire group, you get the impression Olaus Klint is probably in that regard just like you. Mm -hmm. And you could imagine that he might have also done homework on the three of you. Mm -hmm. So this might be a case of like, let's see how much he let's see how much he reveals of what he knows about you in this process and um why it was that he sent the invitation to the three of you. Why exactly that was. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of impression you get from him at this point. He is, however, um, once he's introduced to all of you and noticing Rasmus like really struggling with the luggage or whatever kind of backpacks you all have. Um, well, that was like, take some of the luggage off of Rasmus and says, I think this weather out here is not ideal conditions to describe the issue at hand. I think you should best come inside and maybe give your professional opinion on this. I've made sure, if this takes longer, that rooms for you have been reserved here at the Witch Cat. But uh, let's get out of the rain, shall we? Agreed. Gin and cider. Later walks in. Anna picks up both her sort of small suitcase. I think she's got a very small suitcase with only like the essentials um, and Leto's rather large bag uh, of gear with absolute ease. Like she doesn't even flinch, I think. <laughs> like she just picks them both up and she's like, a most agreeable proposition. Yeah. The only thing I think Leto keeps on himself is the rifle slung over his shoulder mm -hmm. with uh, never let to leave his sight. I think it has like a pearl a, uh, like adorned barrel just something to give it like a a bit of a, a mark right all right so the three of you follow allows inside the main entrance door to the heart of the witch cat squeaking open and what greets you is warmth the contrast between the wet and cold weather outside and the warm fire coming from the hearth here and from the lanterns attached to the ceiling and wall is magnificent. Once the door closes behind you, creaks shut again, there's a sense of comfort coming over all of you. Even though this main hall of the inn looks just as run down as the outside. If you look at the walls, you can see these giant cracks in them. Some of them might even the slightest bit of wind whistling through them while you're inside. The ceiling above you is already some of the plaster that has fallen off. And you can see the attempts where someone has tried to add new plaster to hide the holes in the ceiling, but those are already starting to crack again. But what's also in here is company. A few tables scattered throughout the room, most of them in kind of a semicircle around the large hearth on one end of the room. And of course, a bar with a few stools. And you see a few other travelers here. Um, there is an obvious man of the cloth here in these dark Christian priests outfit, sitting at one table, reading what looks like a nice little novel. Uh, you see a woman in fairly expensive looking clothing, uh, sitting at another table, talking to herself, it seems. Um, there's, a, there's a man, a really burly working class man who is chatting with a fiery red haired woman. And the woman is laughing so loud, it echoes in the room. And you see behind the bar currently cleaning the bar is a man somewhere somewhere in his 60s, with beautiful blue eyes and this large white beard. And he's just looking at all of you entering and just says in a, in a low voice, he says, Welcome. Pick a table you want. We'll be right with you. 
Hmm. I think Rasmus kind of pauses and scans the room, and as he does that, he leans over to Anna and goes, I would have expected more cats with this name. You know, because it's called Witch Cat. It's <clears throat> This is actually an excellent point. You have not spotted a single cat so far in a place called the Witch Cat. Mm -hmm. An excellent observation, Mr. Sigurdsson. As an Thank apprentice you. hunter, it is important to match the obvious with itself. Thank you, Master. Thank you. <laughs> I... That, that's okay. You can call me mentor or just mister. All right. Master's Mr. fine too, actually. All right. Mr. Master. Mentor. Very good. Can I actually, um, like, looking around the, the room in the company, um, I want to sort of, like, yeah, I want to check out the, um, uh, the Man of the Cloth reading a novel. Can I, like, infer from a distance, like, something about him? From what you could see right here, he's a... Uh, he's a rather a rather skinny fellow with a um, big bald spot on the top of his head. Um, looks like uh, his outfit looks like that of every priest you have seen in any town in Sweden. Um, and if you you can quickly see the title of the book and it actually seems to be uh, some kind of cookbook. It's like a it seems like a collection collection of uh, 15. 15 dishes for your community. Hmm. Interesting. Um, a look at the, at the group. Shall we enjoy the amenities? I'd be happy to, yeah. Shall I gather us some drinks? Yeah, but Splendid. take the, take the cheapest thing off the menu for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm because I still need to pay, pay Mr. Pay Master. For a perfectly nice drink for right. us. Let's like I'll pay for it. <laughs> because you set aside the money. Of course. Exactly. The, the money that I have with me at this moment. <laughs> so, Ada, you're going to gather some drinks for. I am going to go, yes, I'm going to go to the uh, blue eyed bartender. <laughs> um. Do I get the sense that the bartender knows why we are here? Like, does it, or, or did uh, did the bartender seem to have any reaction at all that we walked in uh, with Clint? Is there a is there a um, is there a relationship between the two of them? That's what I'm tr I'm trying to garner if the bartender knows why we're here or if it's just. Do you want to you want to know if he the greeting you gave here is the one he would have given every patron coming yes. in, or if theirs was like, "Hey, they're coming in with this guy." Mm -hmm. um, what's what, what's the meaning of that? The impression you got is that um, he uh, he would have he's treated you or greeted you so far as he would every other patron. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So nothing special there. Nothing special. Got it. Um, I will walk over to our blue eyed bartender. Uh, and I would probably already know what Leto would want to drink. <laughs> um, I think that Anna would uh, simply want... Uh, I think that she would probably ask for, like, just a, a steaming hot cup of, uh, like, some kind of tea or cocoa or something like that. Not a very conventional drink for a bar, necessarily, but or a tavern, but just more that, you know, she's cold. <laughs> <laughs> um and um, she will get a um, not the mo not the cheapest drink, but she will pay for it from her own uh, money for for Rasmus to have. Um, because of, I imagine that if she said to the blue eyed bartender, "What's your cheapest drink?" he would say, "Water." <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, you you get the drinks from the bartender who who quickly writes them down and then tells you. Mm -hmm. my daughter will bring them right over just mm. take a seat she'll be right with you can i spot daughter does he gesture to yeah he like you see him like quickly throwing a glance towards a, a girl like you think she's like 16 years old mm -hmm. um who's currently uh bussing another table 
Um, she's currently at a table with indeed this burly working class guy who, who you first, when you came in, saw talking with this red haired older woman now sat down and he's loudly telling her something. You get the impression that those two know each other. And mm -hmm. while this, while this farmer working worker type is loudly telling her a story about how one of his horses almost got away. She's just standing there and she's like, uh huh. Oh, oh yeah, that's, that's nice. And yeah, that's probably the daughter that's going to bring over the drinks. Lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, she seems bored. Great. Um, so I think that um, uh, Anna just kind of, as he's getting the drinks together um, and sort of she's paying, she says, um, how is business? Is this your first time here at the Witch Cat? It is. Oh. Well, I'm going to be honest. We're having a bit of a rough spot right now. Um, well, but if there's anything my, my father taught me about running this business, it's that every business has rough spots. And it's those those lows that make the highs all the more worth it. But I will say, I could do with a little bit less of a re leaky roof. Hmm. Yes, especially when the weather is in sort of gestures vaguely. At that point, outside the creaky window, massive flash of lightning. Hello, kitty. Massive <laughs> flash of lightning and a uh, big boom of thunder. <clears throat> I... I do fully agree. But what are you going to do about it, right? Well, you know, maybe your luck will change. Luck. <laughs> Find yourself a table, ma'am. Your drinks will be right with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she she puts on this very tight-lipped smile and then just makes her way back to the table. Did the others, in the meantime, together with Olaus, pick somewhere to sit? Or what has happened while the drinks were being gathered? So I think uh, we probably picked a table uh, where we installed everything. And right after that, I think Rasmus kind of excused himself from uh, Leto and went to find himself a place where he could uh, have a quiet minute for himself, maybe the toilet or an adjacent room, something where he, he would he would be able to go and have a mild panic attack about the constant lying about money that he doesn't have to Leto. <laughs> um, and then he would probably, if he finds a bathroom, like splash some cold water in his face and try to keep himself together. Rasmus, you do indeed. There is not, there is, there is a bathroom, there is a toilet, there is a separate chamber to do your duty. It has a it has a water basin as well. No mirror or anything in this place, but enough of a space for yourself to vent some of the tension that has been in you for this entire thing so far. You mentioned earlier that as one of the things that you prepared, you took this old and working compass with you. Mm -hmm. Is that on you currently? It's on me. It's in my uh, chest pocket. Okay. So Rasmus, while you are in the lavatory, you splash water in your face and from your chest pocket, you hear a kind of ticking, spinning noise as if there's something moving. Huh. And I look down into my chest pocket and take out the compass and look at it. It's never made that sound. And you see, as you pull it out, that the arrow on the compass is just rotating wildly, just going in circles. Hmm. Would I know, uh, with my knowledge of uh, magnetic fields, <laughs> would I know <laughs> what this could be attributed to? 
or how any about, other general knowledge. <laughs> let's see. How about let, let's do a learning check and right. see how that goes. So that's your, right. your your and your character sheet. You can click your learning, and we get oh, that's one six. Perfect. A naval officer who doesn't know how what a compass is. <laughs> Well, I, I wasn't it. with the Navy long. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. You, you think about like, of course, there's, you've you've heard this in training on your uh, before you went on sea that there is something. There are things that can disturb a compass. I'm not sure if in this day and age things like magnetosphere or something were already concretely used, but especially people who use compasses to navigate on the sea would be aware that there are sometimes weird occurrences that can disturb how a compass works. However, these occurrences in the middle of Sweden and in this intensity with the arrow spinning around so fast, very unlikely. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at that compass and my eyes grow really wide and then I go, oh my God. I, I must tell master and then I run right back out again and try to find our table. I completely you forgot where it was. <laughs> you, try, you try to run out and there's this door of the lavatory mm -hmm. and you try to pull it open and it's not pulling open. I try harder. <laughs> as, as, you, as you try harder, you see that on the place where the door gets into the, the frame of the door, you see that there's this layer of ice that has appeared there. And, and you want to try pulling it open? You want to force it open? Yeah. Can you give me a force check for that? Of course. As you try to pull the door open. Ooh, that is Very weak. no successes. Now, what you can do, if you want to, you can say that you want to push a roll. When you push a roll, you re-roll all the dice that were not a success. However, you also, also have to take a condition for that. Mm. So since this would be a physical roll that you would push, you would either mark your battered, wounded, or exhausted condition for that. Mm -hmm. But you get to re-roll all of them. That's an oh, option, right. but you can also say, okay, these were zero successes. I accept that. I think because I'm in a slight moment of panic after having just suffered a mild panic attack, I think this second moment of panic may just increase that panic I'm I'm currently feeling. So mm -hmm. I will push that roll and try again to open the door. Perfect. If you click the and push I button. The ex I take the exhausted condition, right? Uh, yeah, but first, oh, uh, the best thing to do is first to push the roll. Okay. Because if you mark the, mark the condition first, then it's going to be deducted from your roll. So, Ooh, but now, I see. Two and you rerolled that into two successes, actually, taking the exhaust condition. What does it look like as uh, Rasmus is panically trying to pull open this door? I think he starts pulling like really hard on a door handle for maybe a good two or three seconds before he realizes that it's probably the ice that is, um, uh, well, hindering him, him from getting out. So he starts then like battering with his uh, fist on the ice, trying to break it. Perfect. You batter the ice and there is, there is this sound of the ice crushing under your fists. And as you also pull open the door, it starts coming loose. But the strange thing is, you would expect if you smash the eyes of the door that you see the remains of these ice shards on the floor in front of you. But as you look down, there is no traces of what's happened, no remains of that ice, not even a puddle of water. But eventually you pull open the door and you're free. And, and, I the, compass, run. and the compass has also stopped spinning. Okay. I uh, try to find my way back to our table, uh, still confused about what just happened. And as soon as I get there, I tell like, oh, Master, something really weird happened. And then I try to, with my, like, uh, how do you, like, God, sit on, um, uh, shaky hands. With my yeah. shaky hands, I try to pull my compass from my pocket and show it to him. Oh, you're still oh, you're muted. muted. You're muted. You're <laughs> muted. Master, I can't hear <laughs> my voice. No, my ears are gone. <laughs> I knew this would happen. 
this is the second part of the horror uh, <laughs> moment where so we're just all talking. The compass stops spinning, right? So I'm just looking exactly. at a normal working compass. Exactly. I look at uh, I look at the Rasmus. No, mm -hmm. Mr. Sigurdsson, what I see before me is a normal working compass, and a distraught young man who has just returned from the bathroom. I can no, only no, no. wonder what has caused such distress, but maybe it is not my place to ask, for I am not a proctologist. <laughs> no, Master, I, I swear, it was spinning, like, really fast, just a few seconds ago, and then there was ice on the door handle of the toilet, and I couldn't get out, so I just smashed it with all my all my mighty muscles, and then it opened. But, but there's something weird here. Go on. I mean, that, that's it. That, that's, that's all the story. That's do you have, that the, I have Where is the ice now? I, I don't... I don't know. It was actually gone once I started smashing the door. Hmm. Does this... I think... I think... Uh, can I... Like... Well, actually, does this ring a bell for Leto? Like, this kind of... Occurrence? I do think Leto would understand that if you have been invited to this place because there's strange things happening here, mm -hmm. and one of your colleagues just came from the bathroom talking about ghost ice and weirdly behaving compasses. Um, yo, those are indeed indications for some kind of haunting that could be taking place. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sigurdsson, I believe you do not have bowel troubles. I believe you have troubles more of the fey kind. I believe we all do ever since accepting this invitation. And as you say that, Leto, uh, Anna is actually coming back to the table after she has placed the orders for the drinks. And Anna, you would also see, you would see Rasmus in this distraught state, holding up the compass. You hear Leto saying that there might be some fey issues happening there. But all of you here together would also see that uh, Olaus Clint, the man who invited you, leans forward at the, all these mentions and says, Fey troubles indeed. That is why I invited you over here. This the witch cat. It's a it's a staple in this region for generations. And he like he nods towards the barkeeper and then speaking to all of you in a low voice. Sammy over there. Samuel, his full name. He's been, he got this tavern from his father and his father got it from his father. It's an inheritance within the family. He's been keeping this place clean and running smoothly for years already. From what I gather, he has all the intentions to pass it down to his daughter. And he quickly glances to the teenage girl that's currently busy like assembling the drinks for your table. So he has the intention of passing it on to his daughter, but from what I've heard for f almost a year already, strange things have been happening here. You've seen what the inn looks like on the outside and in here. Hmm. Well, I know that Sami has been trying to fix all the leakages, all the damages as much as he wants, but they keep coming back. It's almost as if this building no longer wants to stand. And yet, there is mirth, there is warmth, there is comfort, yes. undeniably. There undeniably is. But there's also more. I'm trying to track and confirm some rumors that people who have been staying here say that they have seen things. They have seen ghosts in the night. They have seen apparitions in mirrors, in reflective surfaces. I want to know what's going on here. And I happen to know that the three of you work for an organization that has some interest in investigating these matters. I think you call yourself the Society? Miss Rask, do we call ourselves the society? <laughs> uh, um, I have a question on that. Uh, the society is—is uh, is, how secretive is it? 
So what's important to understand is that having the sight is a rare gift mm -hmm. and being actually capable of interacting and seeing the basin is something that only a very small group of people can do. For most people in 19th century Sweden, uh, these kind of phenomena are myth, are legend, are superstition. Um, but for you, these are very real things. Um, and as a part of that, the society itself is not necessarily secret by we want to keep it all secret, but just by the fact because there's so few people who can be a part of it by virtue yeah. of being able of interacting with the basin. It's a very small group. On top of that, the society has only recently been slowly rebuilding its numbers of members. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be, there was an older society about a century ago, but that slowly fell apart. And now slowly over the past 10, 15 years, this iteration of the society has been forming. So it's not so much that you're a secret group. It's more that you're a very small group within an already small group of people who have the site. Mm -hmm. Do I get the sense that he has the site? It's hard to get that sense. Without just outright asking him. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, I think that Anna um, will just kind of take a <laughs> take a <her> cocoa, <laughs> um, <laughs> take a long sip, uh, wipe the moustache that it leaves behind. Um, you've heard of us. I have. There are parts of my profession that force me to be informed. Mm -hmm. I'm an investigator myself. <laughs> I, I deal in information. My task is to find out things that others cannot. And I do know that members of your organization, they see the things I can see. They see they see the little Nisa in their in our homes, the little gnomes that steal our tools. But you also see you also see the the ghosts in the graveyards and the omens and portents. And so do I. But what's happening here? It's a bit too much for one man to investigate. And that's where the three of you come in. So we are dealing with something a little more than a disgruntled house spirit. I'm afraid so. Well then, it's a good thing that you called or invited us. Leto Bokfeld, you know, Anna Rask and recent edition. Mr. Sigurdsson, first name, Rasmus, that's right. Rasmus. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what Anna just leans in and goes, yeah, Rasmus. Rasmus. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, I want a list of whoever's in this tavern currently. Can you provide that? Olaus looks at you and then just gestures around the room. The people currently in this room are the ones currently here. And if you feel so, I think with most of them, you could strike up a conversation if you want. Mr. To. Clint, I believe I asked you for a list. I, I heard him, I heard him ask. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Sigurdsson. I, I, I'll lean in and say, as it might have become apparent already, uh, conversation is not my young master's forte. And Olaus was about to say something, but thanks to that interjection from Anna, he's like leaning back in his chair. Mr. Bockfeld, if conversation is not your forte, maybe I could make use of your forte in hunting? How about while Miss Rusk and perhaps even Mr. Sigurdsson interview the guests here about what has happened 
the two of us could inspect the parameter, see what's happening on the in grounds. Yes. I believe it is time for a midnight stroll, don't you think? Let's hope that the rain is giving up already. It Careful not to trip, <laughs> Mr. Clint. And I think it walks, walks off. Mr. Clint is s soon following after. And just to check, Anna and Rasmus, where does that leave you? What's your approach here? Uh, I think Anna leans into Rasmus uh, and says, um, He's making friends already, I see. Uh, and um, I think that first of all, she would want to, I think she might have caught like the tail end of what was happening. So she might want to just check uh, the the hands of where he, um, Rasmus was trying to like bash at the ice. I just want to see if there's any like um, uh, bruises or any sign that it, it happened basically. Not that I don't believe that it happened, but just if anything was left behind that might be interesting. Yeah, uh, Rasmus will show you where it happened and show you exactly where he saw the ice. And while we go there, I think he's going to ask you... So you said that, that Leto was, was already making friends. Do you think he also likes me? Because I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> <clears throat> The fact that you have remained in our company for so long, Rasmus, is a sure sign that Leto likes you. Oh god, okay. Because I, I really have to come clean. I keep talking to him about about being able to pay him some, some money for teaching me, but I actually don't have any money with me. Hmm. Um, I, uh, <laughs> do I know how much money uh, uh, is expected? <laughs> Um, I think so. I think, I think Leto does excursions like this when they're out of cash, Anna and him. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that, uh, Anna, uh, I think Anna might just go, oh, troubling, but, uh, that reminds me, I still haven't paid you for the help that you did around our, uh, our manor with all of the painting and the, um, I... And she kind of uh, looks in her bag and she starts to produce the money. She goes, no, that's two gold pieces for the uh, the holding of the ladder and, the, and begins to just... Uh, uh, the ladder. In return, you'll help me talk to some of these uh, some of these guests. I am but one person and there are quite a number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for understanding, Anna. Not a word to Master Leto. I won't say anything. Thank you so much. Why does everyone want to be liked by this weirdo? Because <laughs> he's so cool. <laughs> yes. Um, I think that uh, Anna will would want to. Um, she's already spoken to the bartender. Um, right. I think that she would send. Uh, uh, I think that she would want to speak to the daughter next mm -hmm. to see if the daughter has like a different opinion of any, everything that has been going on here. Um, and I think that she would send uh, Ma uh, Master Sigurdsson to uh, the very bolshy uh, farmer <laughs> guy. Um, unless unless uh, Rasmus, of course, wanted to speak to someone else. Uh, no, I'm definitely going with whatever Anna tells me to do. <laughs> Um, uh, and I think that she would say, now this, this one, he's a very, uh, he's a little chatty, but uh, um, I'm sure he has a lot to say. <laughs> so um, we'll send you over there and then I will uh, go and find the uh, daughter. All right. Let's start with Rasmus Sigurdsson chatting up the farmer. We will... Rasmus, you get gently not nudged into the direction of the chatty farmer who has currently just puts down his <laughs> mug with with ale, looks up at you, and goes, Whoa there, that's a new face. Haven't seen you here before. <laughs> yes, hello, good sir. I'm here. Good um, sir, good sir. How do you know I'm even good? Well, I just assumed of your face that you, you were good because you have such a good look on your face. Yes. So... Uh, 
and let me introduce myself. My name is Rasmus, Rasmus Sigurdsson. And Sigurdsson? I'm, uh... Yes. Oh, I once knew a Sigurdsson back when I was in school. It wasn't called Rasmus, but he was called, he was called, uh, what was his name again? I think Nicholas or something. He was also Sigurdsson, like really, really annoying <laughs> brat. He's, uh, he lives in Oslo these days. He think went to Norway. Can you believe it? Why would you want to go to Norway? No idea. Uh, yeah, Sigurdsson. What, you, you were saying something. What, what were you talking about? Uh, yes, 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 yes. So I, um, I'm actually here on a mission. I um, mission. Here, yes, here together with my uh, esteemed colleagues. I'm sure you've seen us at the other table over there. We are actually trying to figure out if there is some, um, if there are some strange happenings uh, happening here in the, oh god, uh, in the Witch Cat Inn, which we are in at the moment, and I wanted to ask you if there's anything that you have seen in these past hours or days that you've spent here, good oh. sir. Oh, it is one very strange thing I've seen recently. Uh, there was this guy talking to me and he didn't even sit down while talking with me. He said he was on a mission and wants to know stuff. Very weird. <laughs> I think Rasmus is really oblivious to the obvious message between the line and just keeps standing and staring at him. The the farmer just <laughs> is taken aback by that and just says, "What? Well, why don't you take a seat? Here, come, sit down. Oh, sit, sure, sure, sit, sure, sure, sit, sure, sure. Sit down, lad. You're, <coughs> you're talking about strange things. You want to know about weird things that happen here. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm, uh, I'm Jonathan. Jonathan Gnais. I'm, I'm uh, so sorry, good sir. I didn't even ask your name. Uh, it's, it's, it's no problem. No worry. Don't worry. I'm not like one of those city folk all uppity tight about their etiquette or what they call it. Name's Jonathan. I've been coming here. I, I, I know Sammy, the owner and the barkeep, since we were like this small, like really small. Uh, grew up together. We were, were up to sh shenanigans together. Uh, great, really great, great, great guy, really great guy, but yeah, tough times right now, really things with the inn, then the thing with his wife, and then also, yeah, his, 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 his daughter, there's a few rough things happening here. I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't tell you that. I really, I'm talk, I talk a lot, don't I? No, no, it's fine. You know, you know, I'm, I'm an investigator basically. So I, I take whatever you tell me. Ah, I see. You're an investigator. Ah, well, well. Um, and you start noticing that as he's like, this is the kind of person who like talks first, thinks second. Probably his mouth moves faster than his thought process is going. And he starts to realize that the things that he already mentioned might be giving away too much. And especially as you as you say like you're an investigator jonathan's expression shifts on his face it's a bit of uh uh there's a bit of hesitance mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. for him and i think despite his uh social awkwardness uh rasmus catches that for a second and he goes so, so um you mentioned something about uh about sammy's uh, or samuel's wife right uh, is she all right? Is she uh, also here? Can you... Can you give me a manipulation check for that? Sure. Seeing if you can convince him to continue as he's realizing that he's might have said too much already. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> That's actually one success. You know, I, I'm just... I'm just... I'm very new at this job, you know, and... Uh, I'm trying to impress my my master, Leto Buchfeld, who just went out with uh, the other um, the other man that we uh, met a few minutes ago, and I'm just I'm just trying to to help him in a sense, and also to help this establishment. So anything you can tell me would be would be good and helpful. Jonathan sighs, leans a bit forward, the chair he's sitting on creaking. You can see that this chair. That most of these chairs here have also been fixed up multiple times already. Even the chairs in this place seem to slowly uh, deteriorate. And Jonathan leans forward and he says, in a lower voice, Nora, uh, Sammy's wife, 
Uh, she, uh, well, she's always been a very, uh, she's always been into these, into these occult topics that she called them. Uh, and a very, like, she was always talking about, like, um, leaving out, leaving out the milk for the, for the little Nyssa, the, 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 the gnomes that help us out at home, um, to be careful where you tread in the forest. I think she always meant well about that, but Sammy was always critical about that superstition of her. Well, it went well, went well. The two fit together perfectly, but then earlier earlier this year, there's 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 suddenly there's all this tension between them. Uh, Sammy and Nora, they I I could hear them sometimes argue in the kitchen, and. One day I come back from a day of hard work and I want to chat up Sammy and Nora and it's only Sammy who's here. And he tells me that Nora just left. Just left him, you know, him and the daughter. And she hasn't been back. Like, I don't know where she is currently, but Sammy's been, well, he's been working harder now. But around that same time, all these things start happening here in the inn like the 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 roof leaks the the there's these cracks in the walls and even once i come here with my horse i put it in the stables and i hear my horse running out of the stables because it got spooked by something we never found out what it got spooked by and i tell you i'll tell you one more thing and i gotta tell you i'm a very grounded man like i'm the kind of i'm the kind of guy I have to need I have to have my boots in the dirt. You know, I'm not up in the clouds with my head. No, you sure is uh, you but, sure don't look like it. No, no. I, well, I can tell. Gonna tell I'm going to tell you this as a grounded man. Yes. I was once helping Sami work in the garden, like again weeding out weeds we had removed just 2 days ago. And there's this this is old they have this old root cellar in the garden hasn't been used in ages and I stand there I turn towards it and I swear by God there's this man standing there old styled suit and this scar around his throat and he's just looking at me and I could feel my bones chill Mr. Investigator my bones were chilling and when I blinked it was gone. But I can tell you that night I did some extra additional Hail Marys and I made sure to go to church on Sunday because I had never seen anything like that in my life. Amen. I I, I, I definitely know what you're talking about and I also understand your feelings. Something quite similar happened to me in my past, which is also why I joined my um yeah, my colleagues in their investigation. Do you know if any other people saw something similar to what you describe? Uh, I think you should, uh, you might want to have a chat with Sammy's daughter, Sophia. And with that, as he says that, we have like this cut over to Anna, who mm -hmm. has been, you've been looking for the daughter. Mm -hmm. um, as you find her as she's currently uh, actually um, cleaning the table that you and your companions have been sitting on but Leto is out now Ulas is out you can hear parts of the conversation Rasmus is having with that farmer fellow over there um, but you see um, as you approach uh, Sophia or the daughter you don't know her name yet by the way uh, mm -hmm. the daughter mm -hmm. has, her, has her back to you while she's cleaning the table how are you going about this? I think I'm. I think I'm gonna. Uh, Anna is gonna use her her servant in, uh, and she's kind of trying to clean this table. And uh, she's gonna say, um, "Ah, alcohol is a real struggle to get out sometimes, isn't it?" And you hear this startled <gasps> sound. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, that person that just appears behind someone. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the the girl turns around. And um, she looks at her, oh, oh, um, oh, uh, 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 I, uh, and she just stumbles over her own words and then looks at you. Uh, it's, uh, um, did I, did I not remove a stain that, that you, that you made? 
Is there anything? No, no, no. Uh, more, uh, I'm talking about the stickiness of the table. She seem, Does she seem a little more nervous than I would expect her to be? She's really, she's on edge. She's nervous. Mm, mm, okay. Um, there's no need to, uh, I'm sorry if I startled you. Of course, I have a habit of doing that. Uh, I work in housekeeping and um, often... Uh, I am to be uh, not not heard and rarely seen. Oh, that's no problem. Is there is there anything I can help you with? Do you do you want another drink? Is there any? Do you do you need a meal? Or oh, is the is the fire too low? Is, is, there, is there more wood in the fire? I think she's going to just go straight to the heart of the matter and say, is everything okay? What's your name? Sophia. I'm Sophia. Sophia. I know a Sophia at home. Oh, yeah, well, um, mother really liked the name. I, father, too, I think. Um, oh. I also like it. Uh, I, I, uh, there's much work to do here. A lot of work. I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you. I don't wish to take up too much of your time. I just, I wanted to ask, uh, Sophia, I have been uh, chatting with my friends and uh, we've been told that you are having some um, issues with uh, leaks and various uh, cracks and things like that, uh, coming back a little bit to Quickly, is there uh, is there anything I can maybe do to help? I, as I said, work in, you know, upkeep and things like that. I just wondered if perhaps I might have something of, of sort of advice. Oh, well, father has been working really hard at fixing all the problems, but his work doesn't fix it. It's it's like he's just a drop of water in the river endlessly mm. moving forward relentlessly pushing <laughs> I mean yes this it's been it's been it's been hard to keep up with these but father is doing his best um my um my shift is uh, almost over uh is there is there anything I can still help you with? And she seems at this other like she's like, you get the impression that she's while she's having a conversation with you, she's also having like three different thoughts running through her head, like parallel, like trying to think about things while keeping the conversation going. Mm -hmm. Is there uh she said her her shift is almost over. Um well, what time does your shift end? Oh, well, I just have to clean a few more of the tables, um, then help uh, then help in the kitchen to get things cleaned up. Um, and that should not be more than uh, about half an hour. Well, how about I help you do those things and then we can talk a little bit more. Uh, kill two birds with one stone, as they say. And you see, as she's like, as you suggest the help, her face is lighting up. And at first you think it's about that she's helped in that, but then she says, do you then afterwards wanna see something I've put together? Of course, yes. But you gotta, but you gotta, um, you gotta promise. Um, you can't tell, you can't tell father. Um, I, I think Anna um, smiles um, and, um, and says, leans in and says, only if you don't tell my master that I'm doing work while we're supposed to be on holiday, hmm? And she she smiles at that. Goes, okay, yes, let's, um, if you really want to help, um, I could use someone to carry these dishes. And she like already gives you a few of the plates and cups and mugs to, uh, so you, you can help her accelerate mm -hmm. the final tasks of her I, I think that I think that Anna's whole thing is she's just going to be making conversation 
in that while she's like helping out with these tasks she's just gonna try to i guess probe uh a little bit and make conversation and ask she's sp spoken about her mother so ask her about her, her mother and things like that and try to i guess get some detail more details about what's been going on and less maybe about what her dad has thinks hmm. about it all and more about what sophia thinks about it all really really driving home <laughs> to want to know what she thinks about that yeah really, yeah really mm -hmm. her view on that perfect mm -hmm. Yes, there's absolutely some conversation happening on that. You do mm -hmm. get the impression throughout the conversation that she is a she's a very soft-spoken girl. Um, mm -hmm. She sometimes stumbles over her words, but there's also at points where she just comes with these these metaphors and comparisons that really speak for a girl who is well-read and um, maybe even inclined to like very writerly tasks like really thinking about the words she says and writes so there's really there is a very artistic root in in sophia um mm -hmm. that doesn't really shine through in the work she's doing here at mm -hmm. the end while you're doing that helping there with the shift we do have leto who went outside with well was clint mm -hmm. the two of you we find you outside in the yard while it is still raining and it's pouring hard. Well, I always has his head on the water drops falling from the brim of his head. And the two of you are making your way through the, through the large garden. It's mm -hmm. like, there's, there's the inn, there's the stables, and there's also a large backyard that is also used as a place to grow um vegetables and the likes right um and also a small little building a smaller building in the garden as well and well that was points at that and he says as far as i've heard there's a there's a cellar in that building root cellar nestled into the roots of an old tree that's no longer here uh, the owner doesn't use it a lot anymore but you can also see how the weeds are covering everything here. I see. We're dealing with an abandoned, moist area, much to the comfort of several Vison species. An occult investigator should know that, of course. And now, a, hunter, a hunter of your capabilities knows a lot about prey, doesn't he? Indeed. And in my line of work, it is a thrill to find out what is the prey and start its hunt. Wouldn't you agree? Is that is the case with any mystery, Mr. Clint? Sure is, but I sometimes wonder, Mr. Bockfeld, what happens if you get the wrong prey? In that case, you better finish the job. At any cost? You better not hesitate when you pull the trigger and the pearl handle sings and like slides finger over the rifle slung over shoulder. May I, may I ask Mr. Barkfeld, how did you c come, how did, Miss Rosk end up in your employ. There is a darkness that falls over his face, but he still keeps up like his hungry smile. An accident put her in my charge. Or perhaps it was fate that put me in hers. And at that point, Olaus turns to you, raindrops falling from the brim of his head, and he says, an accident? fate or a very riskful lure for something you were hunting mr bockfeld i think his expression immediately inverts like the smile is gone but the hunger goes from mouth into eyes you've done your homework it was hard to find that but you have a reputation those with our gifts, well, 
most of us try to peacefully resolve these conflicts we sometimes have with the Vason. Mm. But you have a bit of a reputation, Mr. Barkfeld. I understand. And I, won okay. and I wonder... And he briefly glances towards the inn as if he's trying to look into the direction where your other companions are. Will you put your reputation to surface here? If it is necessary to put to put something down that might be dangerous for many people. I understand that I am hardly in a position to refuse. I will cooperate on my terms. Direct me, I am your rifle. No questions asked. Olaus smiles, looks at you. I don't have any further questions. And as the two of you are standing there, um, Leto, <coughs> you spot something on the first floor of the uh, of the inn. So mm -hmm. ground floor, first floor. Um, you see that there is one. The windows of one room are illuminated by a pale blue light mm. and you see outlining a silhouette standing in front of the windows and from your position through the rain you can see that there's also moisture and like you know you know what it looks like when you breathe on a window pane like yeah. when that moisture from your breath comes on that and you see that that starts to appear on the window mm. and as you squint your eyes and look there, you see that an invisible finger just quickly writes into the moisture, welcome. And on that, with that, you seeing that, we're going to take a break for today's session as we are already at the halfway point for this first part. As we see compasses acting strangely, rhyme and moisture on doors and windows and also maybe some character secrets slowly coming to the front already but first let's take a brief break we're going to take about a 10 minute break we'll be back at about 35 past the hour take the chance to stretch your legs to take a drink thanks everyone for hanging out here with us today and we'll see you in about 10 minutes take care see you soon Hello and welcome back to the second half of the first part of the Dance of Dreams, the Vassan Mystery. In the first half, our protagonists have arrived at the Haunted Witch Cat Inn, starting to investigate what is happening to this place. There have been conversations with the owner, the daughter, the local, and also with the person who brought the investigators here, a certain <laughs> Olaus Clint. One of our investigators had a very direct, spooky occasion with a frozen door and a strangely behaving compass. And just before we went to our break, Leto Bockfeld, the hunter of the group, has seen a blue light on the first floor, a silhouette in front of the window, and then written on the window the word, welcome. And it's at that place where we're going to pick up, still outside, Leto and Olaus Clint in the rain. Leto, what do you do? I turn to Mr. Clint and ask, would that be the prey, Mr. Clint? He looks up. Looks at least like a trail towards it. Hmm. How much of the inn have you explored? It's upper reaches, it's dankest corners. Clearly you have not entered the cellar yet, waiting for a rifle to appear. Now, you must be clear. You've been clear with me, you've been clear with what you know. Now be clear what your aim is here. 
so I can do my job better. And I think I want to, I'm, I'm, this is Leto trying to, you know, uh, convince, uh, Mr. Kent to Clint to, um, share some more about, about what's going on, about why specifically he's being blackmailed, uh, about with this. Uh, and he's, I think, exercising a lot of restraint. That sounds... Do, do you want to use your advantage on that? I do. <laughs> All right. We should give him a big old pat on the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's your choice. Either this would be manipulation in the sense that you're trying to convince uh, allow us to really give you more information. But depending on how you present that, you could also use inspiration as you're trying to just really lean on your reputation and uh, inspire him to mm -hmm. let you know more. I'll, I'd like to do inspiration. I'd like to rely on right. my reputation now. Yeah. Perfect. So I click on that and then I add my two bonus dice. Yes, exactly. But that also means that you've used your advantage for this entire investigation. So you can also then remove the advantage from your character sheet. Very good. Let's go. Worth it? Yeah, worth it. You Are you pleased with the one success? You have the option, even if you have your success, you have the option to push the roll. Does mean that you can re-roll every dice that is not a success, but you will take a condition. And in this case, it would be one of your mental conditions. It would be angry, frightened, or hopeless. I would love to push this 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 roll. And honestly, I think Leto internally is frightened. That okay. So first you can click the push button in Foundry to re-roll that. And after that, you can mark the condition on your character sheet. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, oh my goodness. Sweet. Hello. You're going from one success to three successes. <laughs> and you can then mark the, the, the frightened condition on your character sheet. Yep. Just quickly explain what it means with the conditions that you have. For every condition that you have in one of the categories, you take one penalty dice if you make a check of that category. So when you have mental conditions and you make either an empathy or logic check, or any of its skills, you take a minus one penalty to it for every condition you have in that. Um, so pushing is indeed a good option, but be aware, the more you push, the more conditions you take and the more penalties you have for future rolls. However, three successes is three successes, uh, Leto. And with that, with what you say to allows, he steps a little bit closer and says, I think I can level with you. I have a reason to believe that this place is haunted by the ghost of a former member of your society. And I have reason to believe that if this ghost is not stopped, dangerous information might be coming into the wrong hands. Now, Mr. Bockfeld, I don't want to bore you with the details. But I have reason to believe that this person, the spirit of this person, knows things that could do harm, not just to your society, but to other people as well. I want to verify that. I want to know what this spirit knows. Document it. And then make sure that this spirit can do no more harm to the good people of this place. Interesting. I wonder what your frame of reference for dangerous information is, considering you know a tidbit of my tumultuous past. And yet you consider this a secret worth hiring three investigators for. I also see that if this is truly a ghost, an apparition of some kind, that this creature is able to manifest its powers in a place to make buildings crumble, to make 
things hard to restore. We that speaks of its danger. We have our culprit. Go no. Ghosts. Motivated by emotions. I think he just turns on his heel and walks back inside. Perfect. Leaving Mr. Clint out in the rain and back inside. Is there any specific place where you would be heading later? I think I want to try to go to the first floor. All right. All right. So Leto starts heading up to the first floor. That means, however, our other investigators, Rasmus, um, you have been you had been in conversation with Jonathan, who has been providing some more information, um, giving you some information that there is indeed that the owner uh, that the owner's wife left earlier in the year, year that lined up with when the hauntings started happening. Um, that Jonathan, who you spoke to, also had seen some kind of apparition, some kind of ghost. Um, but there's not much more information that Jonathan can give you at this point. Mm -hmm. You would, however, also notice, while you're in this conversation, you would have noticed that Anna is helping the daughter, Sophia, as you have heard her name as well, is helping the daughter with um, cleaning. You've seen the two of them go into the kitchen, having conversations and everything. Um, and you see that Anna and the daughter are about to apparently leave the the room that you're in, about to go upstairs. Mm -hmm. What you would like to do, Rasmus, at this point? Do I also see how Leto gets back into the house and then heads up to the first floor? Well, that's a good one. Yes, actually, there's a lot of things uh, coming together here. Uh, you would see just before, um, just before you notice that Anna and Sophia are wrapping things up. You see that, again, a newly wet Leto is coming into the inn and mm -hmm. is making his way upstairs. Okay, then I think I would head up towards Leto. And basically, as you're walking by, like past me, I'll start talking to you and like rambling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm walking saying, up the oh. stairs while having a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like towering behind you. I was like, Master, I am, um, I think I have some valuable information. Also, I feel like I missed a really con cool conversation, maybe by, by, by not accompanying <laughs> you outside. But anyhow, I, I, I gathered some information about, um, uh, about the, the, the owner's, uh, the, the tavern's owner's wife. Uh, her name's Nora, and there there seemed to have been some tension between them. And just like a year ago, she just suddenly—it was a year ago, right? She just su suddenly disappeared, and then that's when all these these bizarre things started happening. Uh, what do you think? Is this something something important? What do you make of this? I think Leto suddenly stops, just like stops walking up the stairs, and just turns his head, cranes it, looks like staring at you. <laughs> oh, now this. This Mr. Sigurdsson is good news. We have found, it is. it is, it means we have found an emotion strong enough to cause a, a proper haunting. <gasps> We're dealing with a ghost, Mr. Sigurdsson. Have you ever- Are we really? Oh, we are. That's... I've seen it outside just now. What? Where? Inside. Outside or inside? I, I, I don't understand. I was outside and I saw it inside. So, imp so relatively speaking, we are more likely to be caught in its trap than than we are outside. This is all so exciting, oh, Master Lito. I, I I don't even know what to do. Should we get Anna? I think like are we are we like away from the the rest of the. I would say uh, since you were moving up the stairs and had this conversation and you stopped to tell Rasmus that this is good news, you're kind of like at the top of the stairs and you can look down over the banister of the stairs into the hall and you could see from a distance that Anna is wrapping up with uh, with Sophia, the daughter of the innkeeper. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think Leto goes, Miss Rask, hmm? you are needed. <laughs> I, uh, well, so Anna did say that she would go and see something with, uh, mm. Sophia. Um, um, I think that Anna will give, uh, a, uh, later a look, which later will know what it means, is no. a look of, uh, I'm working an angle here. <laughs> right, yeah, um, yeah. 
uh, and says, of course, Master Leto, I will be right with you, but I must implore that I finish up what I'm doing here. Um, Sophia requires my attention. Understood, Miss Lask. We will be in the first floor. Bring your occult gloves. Mm -hmm. I will, of course, meet you there as soon as I have finished it. And we see from we see from Anna's perspective how both Leto and Rasmus finish their walk up the stairs out of Anna's view, who is still downstairs with Sophia. She's cleaning her hands, putting down a towel, and then looks at uh, Anna. Okay, uh, uh, just need to quickly tell father that the shift is done. And you see her walk over to her father and you hear him say like, like ramble off a list of things that she should have done. Like, are the dishes cleaned? Are all the tables clean? Did she replace the uh, the buckets to catch the rainwater from the leakages in the roof? Um, right. Is uh, Has she made sure that the cook knows what's still in stock and what's already spoiled? Like this long list of things. And um, Sophia's like very soft-spoken, just saying yes, and very briefly just yes, yes to each of these points, not making eye contact with her father. Mm. And you, like, Anna, you know there's like, you can see there's a lot of tension between the two. I was gonna say, um, am I getting tension here? Yes, <laughs> there's a lot of tension, and you also get the feeling as if, um, as if Sammy, her father, is constantly trying to come up with new things that she should have checked mm. off before she heads out. I was but gonna say, do his demands seem like unreasonable? Like, I, I'm a servant, okay? And am I yeah. get, listening to this list and going, wow, that's more than I would be expected to do in like that a short Absol of time? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. He's, there's, especially the longer the list gets, the more there's items on there where you think like, that's, that's nonsense. <laughs> yes. But eventually, um, you hear him say, "All right, you're done." And Sophia just nods and says, "Okay," and wanders off. Not there's, there's not from what you can see from this interaction, not a lot of affection between the two. And mm -hmm. Sophia then, as she turns around to you and comes closer to you, however, once she's close enough to speak in a whisper to you, you see that there's this this roguish grin on her face. And she says, come, I'm going to show it to you. Lead the way. And the two of you also go up the stairs. Mm. And mm. you come up there. Um, and you would see that on the first floor, the first floor is like a fairly small floor with just a hallway with several doors probably some of these are guest quarters for people that stay overnight some of them maybe even private quarters for uh sammy or for uh, sophia um but as anna and sophia come up the stairs we see that at the end of the hallway leto and rasmus are standing in front of the door of the room that should have the window that uh, Leto saw the apparition in. Mm -hmm. right. So we have Anna and Sophia coming up. You see the two of them at the end of the hallway, but Sophia just you know, basically just pulls your sleeve, Anna, and says, mm -hmm. oh, we're going up to the to the attic. It's, it's in the attic. I, uh, I kind of like lean in, so it's like to inform like uh, Anna and uh, and 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 Rasmus, just like what um, Leto was told, but not about the blackmail. Basically, saying it seems that this ghost holds precious information, and it is our task that it not leak. We're dealing with what could be hot news, as it were. Mm-hmm. And, and Anna kind of nods and then continues after, um, um, I think that, I think that she will, um, I think that she will, uh, look at them and say, um, we should all reconvene before bed, I think, and share our respective information. Indeed. 
Mr. Sigurdsson always listen to Miss Rask. I, I, you will I, soon understand why. Yes, yes, Master, I will listen to her. <laughs> I, I mean, I have listened to her. Um, uh, she actually gave... Uh, no, 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 no. Um, never mind. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. Listen to this question. Can you open the door? Uh, of course. And I try to open the door. Is... <laughs> <laughs> just by, I just I try open to open the door, the door by uh, like <laughs> pulling on the handle. <laughs> uh, which is indeed how you would open a door. I think it is. If it wasn't locked. I, I turn to Leto and say, I think it's locked. Since when has the Navy cared about a simple lock? Well, uh, I suppose you're right. And then he kind of backs up a little step and then tries to like slam his whole body weight <laughs> against the door, like in a complete overreaction because he's so nervous. <laughs> oh, we're vandalizing the property, I see. <laughs> right. No, we're helping. <laughs> what, what was it saying again? What, what was it saying again? I have to break a few eggs or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Break a few hinges to get into a room. <laughs> All right, um, Rasmus, can you give me a force test for that as I you try can. to batter through the door? Now, do I, um, does the physical exhaustion, like this condition, does this uh, change anything about my rolling? I at think all? it but should, I think it should automatically apply as you all roll. Right. So I will roll. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. That oh, is. No. That is no successes on your force roll. And I'm just double checking if it actually did apply. Uh, oh, oh, wait, I got the wrong character sheet. You're not you're not my example. It actually applied the penalty already. Yeah, because usually you would have six dice. And since yeah, and you have one condition, five. five dice. No success. Do you accept that? Or would you like to push even further and take an additional condition? I think uh, as uh, Rasmus kind of bounces off of the door and looks at uh, Leto kind of looking for approval, he Leto will then- just write something down. <laughs> <laughs> so he like um, swallows and then takes another big step back and then try tries a second time, <laughs> looking to, uh, to um, make his master proud. Let's see how that goes. Yes, very well. That is still no successes. And you get an additional physical condition that you, oh, no. you can still pick if you want battered or wounded. I think I would probably be battered in that. That and sounds that like it's quite literally You've got bruises all fitting. over your hand. You've got bruises now all down your arm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of um, like uh, nod my shoulder and look at Lito very um, well, kind of disappointed in myself and go, I'm so sorry, Master. I, I, I don't know what's wrong with my with my body. I, I used to be so strong, but ever since I left the Navy, everything's gone, well, kind of like um, jello. Uh, maybe there's another way to get in. <sighs> Mr. Sigurdsson, let us go find the key. Sure, sure. sure. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed in myself. Rasmus. As Leto says that, and as you feel some sense of disappointment in your teach, uh, in having disappointed your teacher, you hear again from your breast pocket <laughs> that ticking sound. I uh, take out the compass from my uh, chest pocket and look at it, and then I slowly turn it so that uh, Leto and Anna can also look at it, and then I go, it's happening again. Something is wrong with my compass. Uh, I think Anna was already going upstairs to I'm the. Up, the oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you show you show later this that the that the arrow is spinning. And as you say that and show that, you notice that you can see both your breath and Leto's breath, as if the temperature dropped around you. And you hear from the door that you tried to batter in, you hear a click coming. Mm -hmm. And then the door just slightly squeaks open, inviting you in. I, uh, I think Leto turns to, uh, <laughs> uh, to Rasmus and goes, I believe 
you did the trick after all. After you. I, I seem to have done so. Oh my god. Mm. That's, uh... Leto. Oh, wait, that's my name. What am I saying? That? Leto. Sorry. It, Mr. Sometimes Secret. I also talk to myself in third person. It's just... Uh... This is Mr. Sigurdsson. What do we know about this ghost? Um, well, so it seems to have some form of uh, magnetic field around it because it makes my compass go really bizarre. Um, and then, I, I don't know, it seems to make stuff freeze, like the, the door handle before. So maybe Astute. it's... It's a ghost of someone that has very cold feelings towards this house. Astute observation, Mr. Sigurdsson. It also means that the flintlock in my rifle will not go off and that my hands are too cold to properly use my weapon. Meaning that I shall be relying on your Adonis strength. And as you say that, I think Rasmus kind of like pushes out his chest a little bit and then like grows about two uh, centimeters even more and like really stretches his back out. And then he goes, I will try to be of service as the best I can. And then he like salutes and takes maybe a second too long to do the salute and then just Mr. tries to step into the into the room that just opened. I think Leto mumbles to himself, Mr. Sigurdsson, you are not in the Marines anymore. You are someplace much worse. I don't even hear that. <laughs> Both of you then step into that room that opened up. But our camera steps up one floor into the attic. Sorry, viewers. And <laughs> where we see Anna moving through a room with filled with boxes, crates. Um, there is old clothing in piles here, but also the ticking of water drops into metal buckets, the mm. creaking of wooden beams, the wood itself gotten, has gotten moist. And you can just hear how the wood creaks and how the wind pushes against the roof of the house. Sophia, at this point, has ignited a little lantern that was hung up at the, um, at the entrance of the attic. A very steep stair that you had to go up there. She's ignited it, and the light casts long shadows around here. As she points towards one end of the attic, where, Anna, all you see at this point is just a collection of large large cloth that seems to cover something large at that end of the uh of the attic hmm. um i think that as she kind of gets up uh i think she sort of um uh she she looks around and uh she sees all of the buckets with the sort of leaks and she says um Oh, the leaks are very bad up here, aren't they? Sophia is either didn't hear what you said or is ignoring what you're saying because she is making long strides towards the end of the attic that she's pointed to. Anna really... is like keeping up with her as she says it. But... And as you get there, she looks at you and she said, mm, did, you, did you say something? Oh, I was talking about the, uh, the the buckets with the. There's a lot of leaks up here. Um, maybe the work of some angry gnome or something. Have you tried a bowl of milk out? Oh, Sometimes uh, they like that. Oh, um. Mother used to do that. Uh, but father doesn't do that anymore. Hmm. Uh, and you? Oh, um, I, I once did that, but father said I shouldn't do it. That it didn't do anything, and that was waste of the milk. So, stop doing it. 
your father seems like an opinionated man and she kind of walks forward um uh and she says this is what you wanted to show me and at that point she glows again with excitement says, mm -hmm. yes okay but you okay well, you promised you, you don't tell father and i don't tell your boss your employer that you're up here, right? We 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 have. That I'm working. Yes. That, that you're yeah. working. Oh oh. Supposed oh. to be on holiday. Oh, this but is. But I this... just I love cleaning tables so much. <laughs> it may I... sound strange to you, but it it really does. However, um, <laughs> you um, th this is, th oh, just let it speak for itself. And she's like giddy with excitement. The complete contrast to the timid and soft-spoken girl you've seen in other moments. And as she, what you're about to show me. <laughs> as, as she moves around the big piece of cloth that's covering something up, could you give me an observation check, Anna? Yes, yes, I can. Let me just find that. Observation. Observation. Let's see. Let's see what we hey, get. Hey, two successes. Two successes on the observation. As you see uh, Sophia scurrying off to slowly start to pull off the the cloth you notice that around whatever is covered by this piece of fabric you see pamphlets that look really familiar you see a bunch of pamphlets that are exactly like the one that you received as an invitation except except without the handwritten note by Olaus but the exact beautiful handwriting the same calligraphy, all exact versions. And there's about a dozen of them here just scattered around mm -hmm. the whatever is hidden here. Okay. Okay. I think that she will pick one up. And as like, I guess like Sophia is sort of like starting to unfold all of this cloth, um, she will ask about it. She'll go, these are amazing. Did you, did you do these? And you just hear from the other side of the hidden object. You hear, but don't see Sophia. And you just hear in the most delighted voice say, Oh, I made them together. Just like I made this together with a friend. And she pulls off the cloth. And at first you don't know what you're looking at. Your, it looks like this. <laughs> apparatus of clockwork a device that has different levers there's ropes there's gears and at first you cannot make out what's what it is but then sophia lowers the lantern she has put on into the center of the device and you see that it illuminates figures like a shadow play it's not just cardboard or wooden <coughs> figures this is a full clockwork powered shadow play machine what? and you see figures of people that are now at this moment still unmoving just flickering with the light of the lantern interesting you made this again the voice giddy <laughs> we <laughs> we made this <laughs> um would, would you would you like me to li like you to show you what 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 what, what, what story it tells <laughs> i'm just loving everyone else like no <laughs> um well i i actually well here's the thing i think that um anna is uh the way that she keeps saying we is concerning to Anna because she's acting as if like there's someone right here that she's like not that she's seeing that I'm not however she's very protective of this girl because this is Anna's way she like just kind of finds people and adopts them um and um I think that she gets a sense that she's gonna get some answers 
um even if even if it might not be even if it might be frightening ones and she's been in some situations you know she travels around with leto so <laughs> um she kind of like tries to i think she tries to match the energy i think she's trying to like make it as if she's excited like if there's something else here that she's not seeing she wants them to think that she's excited too so she kind of like sits herself down like bones only creaking a little bit uh and she gets this going and she goes go on then show me um but i think that she keeps her revolver nearby <laughs> this all sounds like a well-considered choice that mm -hmm. anna is making and as you say that go on show me there are ghosts throwing out my earbuds oh. um as you say come on show me you hear the sound of something winding up, the clicking sound as if someone's spooling up some mechanism. And then the figures, the silhouettes, powered by clockwork, start moving slowly, their long shadows cast on the walls of the attic around you. And Sophia starts telling you what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. A young man wanders through Europe, seeing things few people are fortunate enough to witness. He dances with queens and visits Versailles and the Palais Royal. <laughs> the people perform his plays and praise his name and life dances along like a dream. But the people's revolution sweeps the land with grenades and fire. And at that point, there's actually parts in the background of the shadow play. There's actually a little explosion with a little bit of fire coming out of it. Grenades and fire. And, and his, he, everything is burned down. The young man quickly flees the song of the guillotine and a sharp sound the sound of a guillotine falling can be heard in the room. You have no idea where the sound comes from. Mm -hmm. Our hero returns home to a city in the north. Shadow play figures moving, showing that there's a journey being made. He walks through its gates without shoes and poor. The house where he was born is burned to ashes and his family is missing. He kneels by the side of the road, begging for coin and no one knows that his name was once sung in the palaces of Europe. And the figure, actually, the shadow play figure, you can hear with the clicking of the clockwork, it actually makes a motion that it sits down, reaching out one arm as it's gesturing for, for coin to receive. Suddenly, he sees things no one else does. Creatures creeping, flying and crawling. As the invisibles reveal himself, reveal themselves to him. When he points them out to others, he is mocked. And at that, at, at, when the emphasis is put on the mocked, it's as if the lantern, the light in the lantern, grows brighter for a moment and is briefly crimson red before it returns to normal. A man picks him up from the street and have them bathed and clothed. The man's name is Albert, and his mansion is a place of love and song. Our young hero performs his plays and sings to him for days and nights, and they eat fruit and drink wine. Albert introduces his friends. In the young man's dreams, they are all dancing together, and the shadow figures actually move into this semicircle that starts moving also on a track of gears at which they just keep on dancing in a happy motion. And then the lantern goes out. <laughs> the room is in darkness and you hear Sophia's voice speaking in tandem with a second voice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a distant voice mm -hmm. echoing mm -hmm. but the dream is a lie 
It was you. You brought me here. You asked me to sit down and talk. We spoke of the future. Sophia's voice is fading out at this point. The voice of the 16-year-old girl is slowly replaced by a low, angry tone. It was you. I have the right to refuse. You said so and smiled. And then, and at that point, the lantern goes on again. But not in a normal, fiery light. In a pale blue light. And the only shadow play figure you see is just this large silhouette of a man being stabbed in the back. Oh. And then slowly tumbling forward. You buried my body in unholy ground without a priest or consecration. That's important. <laughs> now, dreams are all I have left. I gaze out over the audience of the Palais Royal. I dance with a princess. I eat cake. I look up into your eyes, Albert, and I let you take my dirty hand. You summon me to Piri's Inn. You make me a villainous proposition. And I decline. You pierce my back. I scream. I die, but now you are back, and I am back. The blue light glows brighter, and Anna, you feel an icy cold behind you. What do you do? Okay. There is no sight or sound of Sophia right now. It is literally just this. Exactly. The last time you saw Sophia, she was kind of disappeared behind this clockwork <laughs> apparatus from which she has probably been spinning it up and putting it together. But you can't see her right now. It's just you feel this very cold presence behind you. I I think that um, as this kind of like uh, Sophia's disappeared and this voice has started talking, I think that Anna has tried to keep attention at the show, but she has reached into her pack and she's trying to find her and, and light her hurricane lamp so that it's whatever is in this room is not controlling like all the source of light and the illusions and everything. She wants to be able to just see, like she wants to kind of, even if it's going to spoil the show, like she wants to kind of like just light up the room basically in her way. Um, Hand Perfect. still at the revolver, so she's doing this sort, sort of like one-handed. Exactly. But you can't fish out your hurricane lantern. You start fumbling around trying to ignite it. And you, you, you get it light up, lit, lit, lightened up as you, as you start feeling that cold presence behind you. And so now there's this mixture of the blue light coming from the shadow play apparatus and mm -hmm. the regular warmer orange light from your hurricane lantern. But there's still this cold feeling right behind you. Hmm. In which case, um, I think I, I've got this lamp. Um, and I think I take a deep breath and I draw my revolver and I turn to see what is behind me. Hurricane lantern in one hand, revolver in the other. You spin around and you see hovering two inches over oh, no. the wooden floor is a figure in a torn late 18th century suit a long coat which has which is torn apart at the end and especially remarkable is at the center of the chest there's like this long gash something must have pierced this entity through the chest from some angle, perhaps from behind. But the most unsettling thing about it is, is that this cre this entity that floats, this humanoid figure, is where a head should be. There's just a ball of blue fire, pale blue light, similar to the light in the um, in the shadow play apparatus. And I need you, Anna, oh. to make the first fear test of our game here. 
Now, fear is a mechanic that gets involved when you are encountering the unsettling, the supernatural, and this is one of those situations. Mm -hmm. So how does fear work? When you have to make a fear test, mm -hmm. you can choose to either roll logic or empathy, mm -hmm. kind of deciding on basis of what do you want to overcome this? Is it by your re rationalization or is it more by your guts and feeling your bravery? Mm -hmm. You get a number of bonus dice for this check for every other player character nearby. Just Unfortunately, no this is no one at the point. I, and, I do have a question to ask. Yeah. Um, and it will, I guess, it will depend on what you think this kind of encompasses. Um, I have a talent that says I get plus two, which I assume is plus two on fear, how many, plus two dice mm -hmm. um, on fear tests when I'm in the presence of someone I have sworn to protect. Oh. Um, so obviously, I'm, I, I, I consider Anna to probably be protective of. Uh, Sophia, but I don't. A, I don't know if she's actually, if I'm in the presence of Sophia anymore, and B, I don't know if it's um, like if I have to have kind of like made an oath, or if it's just someone I feel protective over. If that makes sense, I would absolutely allow to add those two dice in this situation. So, um, in in the kind of vein of mind that she's not just thinking of herself, she doesn't know where Sophia is, but she's like, if this thing is in here and it's going to harm me, it might harm her as well. So. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely. You can add those two extra dice. <laughs> Are you going to roll logic or empathy for this one? I'm going to I'm going to roll empathy because I think that Anna um I think that Anna contrasts with Leto a little bit in that she always tries to approach everything with how can we help this situation? How can we calm it down? With a, a rational discourse. Um so I don't think that she is uh, trying to rationalize it she's looking at it and she sees it and she understands that it's real and she's trying to come at it from like a okay how do I feel about this how is it feeling how do I calm it down I guess all right uh, okay then... so I think if I click this and then I click I, I type in two bonus dice exactly okay and then... let's see how that goes oh two successes <laughs> perfect the thing you see is still startling to you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but your bravery combined with your need to protect whoever is here in this room, even if you're not sure that if Sophia is still here or where she actually is, combined with that need for you to protect others, it makes you stand brave mm -hmm. in the face of this entity. What do you do as you can directly look at this hovering figure mm -hmm. with a ball of blue flame for a head? I think I ha hold the, I hold the lantern. I um, I kind of hold it out behind me as if I'm trying to. If if she's behind me, I'll try to keep her back. Um, and then I will um, I will lower the gun, um, uh, but I will keep it in my hand, but lower it. And I will say to this creature, um, uh, "Where are you buried?" Have you come to finish the job? I fear you have me mistaken for somebody else. Where are you buried? You had me mistaken. You... You will pay. Piri will pay. His inn will burn. Oh, okay. Um, I think that she would just continue to ask the question. She's trying to get through to this, uh, this creature. I'm guessing the sense that it thinks I'm someone else. <laughs> You're getting the um, sense, yes, it's mistaking you for someone else. Yeah, for someone else. Okay. Um, she holds the she holds the light up to her face, I guess, in case that will help it to see that she's not who it thinks she is. Um, and um, she she will say again, um, if you want peace. You will tell me where you are buried so that we can bury you elsewhere. On consecrated ground. Make a manipulation check, Anna. Oh boy. Arguing with a ghost. Let's see how mm -hmm, that goes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try and be calm. 
No one's ever won an argument with a ghost before. Okay. Oh, well, I got two go. successes. Until now. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> two successes. I'm not yeah. necessarily expecting to get the information. It's more like, how do I get it to realize that I'm just not going like... <laughs> to... The entity within a millisecond dashes down from its elevated position and is now right up in your face, Anna. There is no heat coming from this flaming head. Quite the opposite. You can feel rhyme forming on your cheekbones as the figure is so close to you. And then you hear it say, Our meeting spot. Okay. The roots. The... And before he finishes the sentence, <laughs> you see the ghostly figure snap back from you. And then turning its back to you and say, Still so tricksy, are you? Still trying to deceive, are you? No. They will dance. They will dance with me in my dream. And the ghost just sinks through the floorboards and vanishes. Sophia? <laughs> and with as you ask that question to what seems an empty room, we transition over to another room that two of our investigators have <coughs> been invited into what you see here is a room that has a bed a wardrobe a desk uh, shelves with books on them and all of it all the furniture covered up with cloth all the furniture covered up as if this room was once lived in but now someone wants to make sure that dust is kept off of everything but this room is currently unoccupied. I'm still holding my compass, a compass in my hand and looking if it's still turning as quickly as it was before, if the needle is still turning. Excellent. The needle isn't turning wildly, but it's pointing you not north. You hold the compass and you get the idea that the needle is pointing you to one of the bookshelves. I uh, turn the compass to uh, towards Leto and Notion towards the bookshelf. And then I start walking there very slowly, hoping for him to follow me with his rifle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think Leto just, uh, Leto just nods, mm -hmm. slowly takes like the rifle off his shoulder and like makes a motion like, mm -hmm. I'll be over there and just takes up like a covering position just like at this bookshelf cool and just like very um like i think like extremely confidently but also like very silently he like shifts into some sort of uh like he shifts gears right to, to achieve this and it's like a like you're dealing with um like a wolf now mm. <laughs> With Leto having your back, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, Rasmus, you're going to the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can, re the, the bookshelf is also covered in this long piece of cloth, but you can see through it the outlines of that there's probably still books and other objects on the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm, as soon as I get there, I start tracing some of the, um, some of the book covers basically with my finger and then i check if there's dust on everything if it has been touched recently there's dust on the cloth that's mm -hmm. covering everything oh it's completely okay it's sorry i understood that there were books that i saw then of course i pulled the cloth off <laughs> okay you pull the cloth off and there's no dust on them mm -hmm. they have been protected by the cloth mm -hmm. and as you pull the cloth off however it comes down in a smooth motion and while you're checking out those books, Leto, can you give us an observation check, please? 
can I argue for vigilance instead? Oh, that makes perfect sense in this situation. Okay. Yes, absolutely. You okay. can go for vigilance. I also have a talent called Bloodhound, which uh, gives me plus two vigilance while tracking prey. How applicable is that right now? Well, we had a, you had this earlier conversation with Olaus where he actually said to you, this is part of the trail of the prey. So yeah, put yeah. that in there. Take put those extra dice. Oh yeah, okay. So that's, uh, yeah, plus two bonus dice. Uh, do I just cl click the talent and it's automatic? No, you can uh, click the Vigilance skill, uh -huh. and then you have to add the two dice. Oh, okay. There we go. And here we go. Ooh. Seven, uh, ooh. 70s to S. Two successes, yeah. Two successes for that. As you see Rasmus pulling off the cloth and you're keeping an eye out in the hallway, you do hear that there's footsteps coming up from downstairs. And you hear the voice of the barkeeper and the owner. Uh, you hear the voice of him saying like, Sophia, what are you doing up? Hmm. I think immediately, um, <clears throat> Leto jumps up from his position, uses the cloth on the ground and like hides Rasmus and himself just like <laughs> basically so basically pulling up the cloth and trying to hide both you and rasmus in the room nearby the bookshelf that rasmus is yes exploring and i would like to point out that rasmus is standing with his back towards you so he doesn't see that you're doing no. that so suddenly you just have like the cover yeah. <laughs> cover over it is being pulled over you um as that happens, Rasmus, were you checking out any of the books or anything else on the bookshelf? Yeah, I was checking if the if I can figure out if my compass is pointing towards a specific object. Do you move your compass like mm -hmm. past the bookshelf? Mm -hmm. And there's actually you see that the arrow, once you pull it past one of the books, mm -hmm. the arrow starts pointing mm -hmm. towards that book. Mm -hmm. And then I'm guessing as I try to grab that book, suddenly the cloth is thrown over my, my back and I'm like, oh, I can't see anymore. <laughs> I've gone blind. Mr. Sigurdsson, we appear to have guests and we are in forbidden grounds, relatively speaking. Now, you may have seen a book that is to our interest. So why don't you pocket that and we wait this out? Okay, I will. And then I try to pull the book and put it into like underneath my coat jacket. As you do that, grabbing the book, while you're under this blanket, both of you can hear the footsteps of Sammy coming closer to your room where you are, the floorboards creaking where he walks. And you can hear him say like, Sophia, I told you to not go into that room. And you can see him now from, the cloth is not like, the cloth is not so thick that you cannot see through it. You can like at least see a little bit of like the figures and silhouettes. Um, so you can see that there's coming into the open door of the room, you see the outline of Sammy and he's looking into the room. And I would like from both of you, please, in this situation, a, from both of you, please, a stealth check, please. Okay. What's your stealth? <laughs> Mr. Zero. <Stevens>. Oh boy. <laughs> can I help out in any way? Um... You, well, it's either that both of you will be rolling or one of you can decide to do the rolling and the other explains how they're helping out the other one. Um, if that's something that they could, if that's a plausible way to help out, then the one who's rolling gets an additional die to roll. All right. Do you want to roll cash or? I feel like that should be you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And in what way? In what way would Rasmus? In what way could Rasmus help in? Um, I think the best way that he could try to think of helping would just be pushing his gigantic body closer towards the bookshelf, so he can <laughs> maybe make himself look a little bit smaller. He looks like a rectangle. <laughs> it's just a bookshelf in front of a bookshelf. That's what <laughs> yes, it's uh, becoming. <laughs> All right. 
Um, that means if you go roll stealth, Leto, you can add mm -hmm. one extra die to that roll and see how that goes. Oh no! Zero successes. <laughs> on eight dice. On eight dice. Do you want to push it or not? Of course, I want to push it. <laughs> uh, there we go. Better. Yeah, ah, that, much better. That is one success, but you also have to mark an additional physical condition in this case. I think exhausted applies that here. Sounds very fitting <laughs> at what's happening so far. Cool. You. With, with Rasmus helping out by using his huge frame to camouflage in the environment, but also Leto's natural or stealth skills based on experience. I could imagine mm -hmm. someone of your profession that has quite some practical experience with it. Yeah. You remain, both of you remain quiet as possible. And Sammy looks into the room and then you see that he's about to step into the room. But then you also see something else. He stops in his movement. And through the cloth both of you are under, you see that his eyes glow pale blue for a moment. The foot he was about to step down slowly hits the floorboard. And then he starts sobbing. You hear that he starts to cry. And you hear him mumble, what? what have I done? What have I done? No, no, I, no. He walks out of the room and you hear him go down the stairs. At the same time, all of you hear from downstairs the sound of th things falling on the ground. Things? Maybe people? And you also see that through the open door, there was some of the light from downstairs was still shining up the stairs and shining into the hallway that's outside of the room. But as all of this happens, that light shifts color. The warmth of the light from the hearth, this nice orange, so welcoming when you came in from the rain, turns pale blue, basking the entire inn in this unholy light. And from somewhere, well, maybe from everywhere, you hear the sound of this old-fashioned clavicymbal, these old-fashioned pianos playing. And Anna up, on the, up in the attic, and Rasmus and Leto down here, all of you here an acqui voice saying, welcome to the dance of dreams. And that's where we're going to end today's session Ooh, and no. oh pick up God. next week for part two. <laughs> All right. Can't do that to me, man. You can't do that. <laughs> I'm afraid I just did. Um, Terrifying. All right. Thanks to all of you for making it through the first part. How's everybody doing? How's the how's the vibe here? Heart I'm rate exhausted. <laughs> I had yeah. to take a breath after my bed. I was just like, whew. I've got all those conditions listed off for myself. Like, whew. Yeah. <laughs> I just saw Krifu uh, write in the chat that this is so intense, and this is exactly what I'm feeling. <laughs> this is very intense. Incredibly intense. I am... Um, I am so far very glad with the actions you as your investigators are doing, how you're really also trying to involve every different angle in here. And it's really cool to see all of you play your characters. Um, and I'm really excited to see how this continues in our second part of this next week. But I also agree, this is a good point to point to um, 
let some of that tension go <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and and exhale. Um, thanks for you for playing here on this first part today. Before we head out, I want each of you to have a chance to quickly remind our viewers who you are and uh, where we can find you if you can be found somewhere. Um, and um, then we wrap this up for today. And I'm just going to, uh, I started out with the introductions by just going, starting to the right of me, but I'm gonna break up this rhythm and let's start in the bottom left, which is uh, Ruben. Hey, Ruben. Hi, I'm Ruben. Uh, I played Leto Bokfeld in this session. Uh, you can find me on Blue Sky, really, sometimes. And that's where I just dump um, just ironic jokes. If you really want to see me in action, then I'll be, uh, well, next week on Horde of Tales, but also on Phantom Arts Entertainment, which is a tabletop actual play uh, Twitch channel uh, that I frequent. So uh, see you there, please. Awesome. Glad to have you here, Ruben. Let's move it over to Cash. Yes, I'm still Cash, and I'm still playing <laughs> Rasmus Sigurdsson. And on some social media, you can find me as Elias Kasalaya, which is hard to say, I'm really realizing right now. Um, and I'm also part of a German actual play group, which is called Würfelbande, and another one which is called Platonic Pals. So you can check that out if you speak German and are interested in some other actual plays. They're not as creepy and intense, though. <laughs> as someone who does speak german definitely check out um the other shows that cash is in they're very entertaining so make sure to check that go over there awesome thanks you for having you and on to another player with a k cat hello i'm cat uh i'm otherwise known as the law mistress uh, on the internet or uh, law mistress 93 is where you will find me on most social medias um i uh write normally and edit things and um i do actually uh do a lot of these streams uh i have my own channel so over on twitch uh the law mistress is my twitch channel um and uh we will be starting our game of uh tales from the loop um mm. which mm. we have now cast and there will be ads and things out on that you can find that at my social media um but it is a sponsored free league game and i am very very excited you know like this is a free league game um and um yeah i'm very excited to get that started and we we've been pre-recording so that will be sort of around uh, end of april beginning of may we will have that first episode out but yes uh thank you so much for having me i'm really enjoying this uh and really enjoying the vibe <laughs> i like horror a lot so mm -hmm. <laughs> Th thank you for being here and thank you so much for joining us and thank um, you for gming marcus you're an yes. amazing gm <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, I am Marcus, GM slash chaos facilitator of this group, and not just this group, but also part of the organization here at Horde of Tales. Um, there's a few things I love in life, and one of them is running games for people, and I had a really great time running Vasen today, and I'm glad that you also enjoyed it. You can find me here on the channel doing lots of things. You can find me next week back here for the second part of uh, Vasen and the Dance of Dreams, so definitely come and check us out next time. Thanks to everyone who come came over here today to also check us out live thanks to everyone in the future who's watching the vod of this if you enjoy what we're doing here um and you want to help us out it really helps us if you for example here on twitch follow us on twitch or if you're capable to throwing us one a, a subscription here on twitch if you happen to have your amazon prime subscription and you haven't put it to use yet how about sharing it with the lovely people over here at hall of tales you can also find us on multiple socials. We're over on Instagram, on Blue Sky, on Twitter, and we're even starting to post on TikTok. So you can follow us all there over on our name, everything, everything called Horde of Tales over there. And you can find all the VODs of our games and all the other cool stuff we do. For example, last month was a full month of Women in Gaming Months 2024 with a lot of fantastic games and panels. And you can find the VODs of all of that on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Horde of Tales. One final note here, we are currently also, or currently open our putting up nominations for the Crit Awards. And if you have enjoyed any of our programs and shows that we have done over the past year, um, we would really appreciate if you want to nominate us for one of the categories available in the Crit Awards. I've put an overview in our chat with a link to vote and also some suggestions of the categories that you might want to nominate one of our programs for. 
Uh, if you do, thank you already so much for your support on that. It really helps and also just everyone who comes here to watch your games. It's always a compliment and it's always a joy to play with people. That being said, we are going to leave this creepy tavern behind for now. We're going back into the 21st century, but we will be back next week, same place, same time, for the second and final part of this game. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe, take care, and see you soon on Horror. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.